Hi there, I'm Sam Moser. I'm excited to be back with this video that really dives deep into how to build a high-powered electrical system for your camper. The structure of this video is just going to follow along step by step as I built this system and explain what I'm doing and the components as I go. With that said, I'm going to roll right into it. The first thing I needed to do was build the cabinet that would house the electrical system. You want to make sure that one, there's enough room for all the components and wiring, and two, the components are organized somewhat relative to where their wiring connections are going to go. Once I had a plan for the enclosure, which I'm building out of plywood, I started cutting out all the pieces. Once all the main pieces were cut, I added edge banding on the panel edges that would be exposed after assembly. To join everything together, I drilled for pocket hole screws. Then I assembled everything using glue and pocket hole screws. I built this cabinet in two sections, a bottom section and a top section that sits on top of it. The primary reason for this was to make it easier to move since I'm building it in the shop and then bringing it to another location to install it in the shuttle bus. The housing you build for the electrical system in your camper likely won't look like this one. The shape of this system wouldn't fit well in most van layouts, but it was designed for the space inside the larger shuttle bus that it's going in. The bank of six batteries will fill the bottom of the lower section with the Lynx distributor, a cutoff switch, the shunt, and a main fuse mounted just above them. In the upper section, the top corner has a nook to fit the combined AC-DC distribution panel, and the rest of the components fill up the remaining space. These consist of a solar charge controller, two DC-DC chargers for alternator charging, and the inverter charger. I'll go into details on each component as I go. At this point, I mounted each component to the enclosure. First, aligning it how I wanted, then pre-drilling holes, then adding screws. I repeated this for the remaining components. The inverter charger, a Victron MultiPlus 3000, is quite heavy and it mounts a little differently. It has a cleat that is screwed to the wall, then the unit hangs on the cleat. Two additional screws along the bottom lock the unit in place and prevent it from being able to bounce off the cleat. Given that all this is going into a camper that'll bounce its way down the road, you want to make sure all the components are securely mounted to a sound structure. For the components down here, I'm going to do something a little different. In order to fit these together compactly, I'm going to make custom connectors using copper bar instead of wire. Using copper bar like this is a great trick, but you have to make certain that you use large enough copper bar to support the current requirements of the system. In this case, the wiring from the batteries needs to be 4 aught gauge, which means the copper bar needs to be a quarter inch thick by three quarter inches wide minimum to have the same cross-sectional area as that 4 aught wire. First, I measured and marked the links I needed to cut on two copper bars one three inch piece and two two and a half inch pieces. I used a portable bandsaw to cut the copper, but you can also use a hacksaw or whatever you have. Copper is softer and easier to cut than most metals. I used a file to clean up the cut edges. Next, I marked and center punched locations for drilling holes. The hole is centered side to side and set in a half inch. At the drill press, I first drilled a smaller pilot hole and then followed with the full size hole. Some needed a 5 16 inch hole and some needed a 3 8 inch. The drilling process often leaves a burr on the underside of the metal, so the last step is to remove this burr. A simple deburring tool like this works fine. This is really important so that the copper has as much surface area in contact with the mating surface as possible. After all that, the custom copper connectors look like this. But, there's one more problem to solve before the components can be assembled. The top of the shunt and the top of the Lynx connector need to be level so the copper bar can sit flat across both. This is not just a problem for the shunt, but for all the components we're connecting together with these bars. In this case, each needs to be raised up a little different height. What we'll do is find or create shims to lift each one. Let's look at what not to do though. You don't want to add washers underneath the copper bar itself to try and raise it. In order to minimize resistance at the connections, the mating surface need to have as much surface area in contact as possible. So the lug or copper bar in this case 
should sit directly on the connection without a washer underneath. For the shunt, I'll take advantage of the fact that the height difference is off by the thickness of two washers and simply add these as spacers underneath the shunt when mounting. Now for the battery cutoff switch, which attaches to the fuse holder on one side and the positive terminal of the Lynx distributor on the other side. These both needed a larger spacer to bring them to level. I tried sliding in various things to get a rough idea of the right size spacer needed. It ended up being a little less than three quarters of an inch for the switch and a little more than a quarter inch for the fuse holder. I cut some pieces of plywood to the right thickness to get everything lining up evenly. Now the way I cut these was a little unconventional and probably not good for my planer blades, but I used my planer to thin the pieces as needed, testing the fit as I went. There may be a better way to make spacers for these components, and if you have one, feel free to leave that in the comments below for others to learn from. The important part is just that the copper bar sits level and makes full contact below so that electricity can smoothly flow through our system. The alternate route for connecting all these components is to use wire and wire lugs. That works equally well, you just won't be able to mount these four components as closely together. Now that the copper bars and spacers are all ready, I went ahead and bolted together this assembly. You will need to purchase the hardware to bolt the copper bar to the links separately. For this, you just want to buy 5 16 inch bolts, flat washers, lock washers, and nuts. Stainless steel hardware should be used here to prevent corrosion. Two important things to do here that I didn't capture are to make sure and clean the copper bars and contact points before assembling. Isopropyl alcohol, denatured alcohol, or electrical contact cleaner can be used for this. The second is to use a torque wrench to tighten the bolt to the proper specification, which varies component to component. I'll list the torque specs for these on the screen, and they can also be found in each component's manual. With this assembly bolted together, I'm ready to mount it. I checked that the positioning would give enough clearance for the batteries underneath and for the wires above then secured everything down. Before going any further, let's take a second to look at what each of these components are and how they fit into the system. Following the positive wire as it leaves the battery bank, it connects to this fuse holder. This is the largest fuse in the system and the one that protects the battery wiring. Here I'm using a 400 amp a &L fuse. A class T fuse would also be suitable here. After the fuse, there's a cutoff switch. This connects or disconnects the batteries from the rest of the system. The current rating of this switch is really important since it must be able to handle all the current flowing in and out of the battery. Here I'm using a Blue C E-Series switch, which is rated for up to 350 amps continuous and up to 600 amps intermittently. Following the switch, there's a Victron Lynx distributor. The Lynx combines a positive bus bar, a negative bus bar, and four mega fuse holders in a compact package. It's honestly a good value compared to buying these components separately. By the way, this schematic and full parts list is available on my website. The video description has a link that'll take you there. Back to the components. Connected between the negative side of the battery bank and the negative terminal on the Lynx, there's a shunt for the battery monitor. This is what measures the current flowing in and flowing out of the batteries. It also has a small wire that connects to the positive side of the system so that it can track the battery voltage. The shunt is included with the battery monitor. It's not something that has to be purchased separately. When installing the shunt, you want to pay particular attention to which side is labeled battery only and which is labeled load and charger. There should be no connections other than to the battery on the battery only side. If any load or charger is connected to this side, the shunt will not be able to measure its current flow, which can lead to inaccurate state of charge calculations by the monitor. Next up, we'll prepare the batteries and battery wiring. This is a 12 volt system, so all the 12 volt batteries will be connected in parallel. That means that all the positives connect together and all the negatives connect together. After figuring out what length I needed, I measured and cut all my pieces to length. The wires between batteries should be equal length. This keeps the wiring resistance between batteries even, which helps them charge and discharge equally. 
This system requires 4 aught AWG wiring for the battery bank. Wire sizes for all parts of the system are included in the schematic on my website. You do need to have the right tools for working with wire this thick. I'll leave links to these tools and all the others needed for this build in the description below. Next, strip the insulation back about one inch. Here are two stripping methods. The first way is to use the cutters to cut through the insulation with a rotating motion. Doing this, you have to be very careful with the amount of pressure you apply so you don't cut too far and nick or cut the copper wiring inside. Once the insulation is cut most of the way, you can bend the wire at the cut line and it should break off the rest of the way. Another method is to use a special stripping tool like this. It has a little blade that sticks up to cut the insulation but can be adjusted so it's not long enough to cut the copper inside. With either method, it's usually handy to also have a utility knife with a fresh blade at hand. You can use this to help cut the insulation as well. If you haven't done this before, practice on some scrap wire first. Larger wire can be fussier to strip. Once stripped, slide the lug onto the wire. Crimping the lug requires a special crimping tool. Here's how this one works. First, adjust the tool for the given wire size. Slide the wire in and then squeeze the arms of the tool together till adequate pressure is applied. Since different style crimpers work a little different, my general advice is to just make sure you read the instructions for whichever tool you use. It's super important that your crimps make a solid mechanical connection that isn't under crimped or over crimped. Bad connections anywhere in the system are a real safety issue. Lastly, we'll add a piece of heat shrink to cover the transition from cable to lug. For the 4 aught lugs, 1 inch heat shrink slides over the best. For the rest of the wires, I repeated the same process of strip, crimp, heat shrink. Here's how all these wires connect. Here I just have it mocked up on the bench, and I'll wait till I'm putting everything together in the camper to assemble these within the enclosure. Next up, I made the wires that connect from each end of the battery bank to the fuse and shunt. Here I made sure that the total path of each wire was roughly the same, from where they connect to the battery to where they connect to the links. I didn't add this till later, but now is also a good time to connect the small voltage sensing wire that comes with the battery monitor shunt. The side with a ferrule connects to the B1 terminal on the shunt, and the side with a ring connector connects to the positive battery terminal. This wire comes with a 1 amp inline fuse to protect it. I like to get all the largest wiring in place first, since those are the hardest to work with. So next up, I'll prepare the wires for the inverter charger, a Victron MultiPlus 3000. The inverter charger performs three key functions in this system. The first function is as an inverter. This means it takes the 12 volt DC power stored in the batteries and converts it to the 110 volt AC power to supply standard household style outlets. The second function is as a charger when connected to shore power. This means it takes the 110 volt AC shore power and converts it to the lower DC voltage required to charge the batteries. The third function is as an automatic transfer switch. This means that when connected to shore power, instead of using the inverter function and battery power to feed the AC output, it directly passes through the shore power input through to the AC output. Once shore power is disconnected, it automatically switches back over to using battery power. All the connections to the MultiPlus 3000 are located under the front cover, which comes off after removing the four screws on the front. Once you figure out the length of wire you need, the rest of the process for making these is the same as before. There are three 4 aught wires to add. The first is the enclosure ground, which connects underneath at the bottom right corner of the unit. The other side of this wire connects to the center stud on the links. The second is the negative battery connection. The third is the positive battery connection. This will connect to a 400 amp mega fuse on the links. We'll come back to the inverter later to do the AC wiring, but for now I'm going to continue with the wires that connect to the links distributor. Next, I'll connect the links to the output of the Orion DC-DC chargers. 
These are for charging the batteries from the alternator while driving. They will get programmed so that they only charge while the vehicle's engine is on. I'll cover the programming settings later on in the setup. This system has two of these 30 amp units connected in parallel, which gives 60 amps of charging while driving. For most vans, this is about the most you want to pull from the stock alternator without having a secondary dedicated alternator just for this purpose. Preparing these wires is basically the same as the larger ones. First cut and strip the wire. This time I'm using a smaller pair of wire cutters. Then add the lug and crimp it on. Finally, finish it out with some heat shrink. Now that's for the link side. For the charger side, it's a little different as there's a wire terminal instead of a stud. This makes it easy, but for stranded wire, it's best practice to add a ferrule to keep wire strands all together. First, I'll strip the wire just the same. Now we'll add a ferrule over the end. And using a ferrule crimper, I'll crimp the ferrule down. I'll connect the negative wire and the positive output wire of each charger to the links and add a 40 amp mega fuse to each. Once more of the wiring is in place, I'll come back and secure wires down with mounting zip ties. For now, I'm just getting them made and in place. Next, I connected the output of the solar charge controller to the links in the same manner. The solar charge controller does just what it sounds like. It manages battery charging via the solar panels. The solar charge controller should be sized relative to the amount of panels you plan to put on the roof of the camper. For a typical camper van, which has more limited roof space, I usually use something like the Victron Smart Solar 130 or 150. This system is going onto a 30 foot shuttle bus, which can accommodate a larger array of panels, so I upped it to the Smart Solar 150 100. Next up, we'll add the wires that supply power to the DC fuse block on the distribution panel. The DC fuse block is the point where all the DC circuits that are spread around the bus connect and receive power. The DC circuits cover most of the basics in the camper like the lighting, fans, water pump, the refrigerator, and more. For these, I'm going to make use of the studs on the end of the links for a few reasons. Firstly, there are no more fuse slots left on the links. More importantly though, I like having a cutoff for the DC fuse block. Here you can see that I mounted a Blue Sea breaker next to the links. The breaker acts as both current protection for the wire and a cutoff. A DC cutoff is really nice for any time the camper is not being used and you want to put the electrical system in a storage mode. If you can cut off the DC fuse block, you can make sure nothing is accidentally left on that'll deplete your batteries while it's sitting. The other end of these wires will connect to the DC fuse block in the distribution panel. I'll connect the inputs to the DC fuse block next, but first let's prepare the inverter output wiring. For the AC input and output on the wire, I'll use triplex cables. Here I'm using 10 AWG triplex, which is good for up to a 30 amp main breaker. If you want a 50 amp main breaker, you need to up the AC output wiring to 6 AWG. The MultiPlus has wire entry glands for the AC wires. Slide the nut of the wire gland over the cable and then slide the cable through the body of the gland. Then guide each wire into the appropriate terminal. Tighten the nut onto the body of the entry gland and then tighten the wires into the terminals. Make sure the wires are fully seated in the terminals. Finally, I routed the outgoing part of the cable along the path I wanted. I'll tidy and secure the wires down with cable ties a little later. That is the AC output that takes power from the inverter and supplies the AC distribution panel. The inverter also has an AC input that comes from a shore power inlet. I can't install the AC input wire until I get this system moved into the bus and have the shore power port installed, so I'll show that connection later. Now, I'll do some work on the distribution panel. The distribution panel is the interface between the electrical system and the circuits that run all across the camper. This is a combined AC and DC distribution panel. 
That means that one side is for the AC breakers to protect all the 110 volt alternating current circuits for normal household style outlets, and the other side has a DC fuse block that I described before. The back of the distribution panel has knockouts for the wires to enter through. Cable clamps should be used in the knockouts to secure the wires in place. Here are some examples of different sized and style cable clamps. For the AC input, I'm installing this metal connector. It drops in from the back side, and then a nut secures it in place from the inside. The distribution panel has built-in clamps that will secure the rest of the AC wiring. I'll show this more later. For the DC inputs, I added these plastic snap-in connectors. Bringing the panel back over to the enclosure, I fed the inverter output wire through the clamp and tightened it in place. Then, I fed the DC fuse block wires into their connectors. I left slack in all the wires feeding the distribution box so that the panel can be pulled out for access to the back at later points. Next, I connected the positive and negative wires into the terminals on the fuse block. That's as much as I can do on the distribution panel until I bring this whole thing into the camper, which is what I'll prepare for next. Using these mounting zip ties, I'll start to secure down the cables, leaving them loose for now. At this point in the build, I packed things up and brought them here. This is the shuttle bus conversion that the system is going in. It's a project by Chewy Design Co. At the time of shooting, the bus was still a work in progress. The electrical system will be located in the back corner of the bus, and then a low bed platform, closet, and some other bits will also be constructed in this back area. I moved the bottom half of the enclosure into place. All the wiring running throughout the bus originates from this back corner, where I'll wire it into the distribution panel. Before securing the box to the wall and into the floor, I'm going to drill a hole for the two wires I need to run under the bus, the chassis ground and the alternator charger wire. Here, I'm drilling a pilot hole, but before this, I measured and checked for clearance underneath the bus. Then, I headed outside and under the bus to make sure the pilot hole was in an okay spot before drilling the full-size hole. I used a hole saw to drill the hole cutting through most of the flooring layers from the top, but drilling from the bottom up to prevent tear out in the plywood layer, since unlike a van, the floor of the shuttle bus is plywood and not metal. I used coarse sandpaper to smooth out the edges both top and bottom. I secured the box into the wall using construction screws, and I secured it to the floor using the previously cut pocket holes. Now I can add the batteries and secure them in place. Whenever installing batteries in a camper or vehicle, make sure they are fully secured and cannot move, slide, or bounce around. Here I'll use wood strips to fasten everything down, but ratchet straps and anchors are another common method for this. The wooden strips screwed into the floor lock the batteries in place side to side and front to back. The strips across the top prevent the batteries from being able to bounce upward. And with that, they are all locked in place. Next. I turned my attention to the work I needed to do under the bus, starting with the chassis ground connection. In vehicular systems, it's standard for the battery negative to be grounded to the vehicle chassis, or in other words, grounded to the frame. This should generally be done with a wire that is as large as the largest current carrying conductor in the system. In this case, that's four op gauge. Starting with the connection inside, I connected this end of the wire in between the shunt and the links, and secured the rest of it in place before heading under the bus. The wire comes out here, and I'm going to bolt it to this main frame piece here. There weren't any holes available near where I wanted, so I opted to drill a new one, starting with a smaller pilot hole, and then moving to a larger bit. Once through, it looked like this. But in order to get a good electrical connection, the paint needs to be ground away in the area under the lug. The lug should seat fully on bare metal. You can use a star washer instead, which has teeth that will cut through the paint, but that doesn't give as good of a connection. I marked out the shape of the lug and tried to not grind away more than necessary, but enough for full contact. Now, I can bolt the wire on. 
using stainless steel hardware and a nylon lock nut. To prevent corrosion, I'll spread some dielectric grease all over, both here and on the back side where the head of the bolt is. To finish things off, I wrapped the wire in split limb for protection and then used cable clamps to secure it from one side to the other. And you may have noticed that there's a second wire here now too. I didn't film mounting this one, but here's the rundown. The second wire ran is for the alternator charging. This one crosses to the other side and then heads towards the front of the bus. This wire needs to connect to a positive 12 volt source powered from the vehicle's alternator. An easy place to make this connection is at the starter battery. This bus actually has three starter batteries all in parallel. The compartment on the right was pretty cramped, so I opted to add my connection in the compartment on the left. Here, I added a breaker and connected the other side to the positive battery terminal. Here is the other side of that wire. For now, I'll set it aside till I wire it into the chargers. At this point in the installation, I have the enclosure secured in place, I have the batteries secured in place, and I have the necessary wires run underneath the bus. Now I can connect all the batteries with the wires I made earlier, and then connect everything else. At this point, as the batteries are getting linked together, you need to take extreme care to not drop or misplace your wrench in such a way that it can touch between a positive post and a negative post and create a short circuit. If this does happen, the internal battery management system in the batteries has some protection against short circuits, but for safety's sake, you really want to try and take care and avoid this. Here's what it looked like with the battery bank all connected. Notice how the main positive connection is made on one side of the parallel battery string, and the main negative connection is made on the other side of the string. We're now ready to put the top half back in place, but first I need to cut some holes for vents, the battery monitor display, and the inverter controller. On the topic of vents, don't forget about airflow when building a system like this because the components inside need to have ventilation. I located these two vents above and below the inverter charger, which is the component that typically generates the most heat. There's also an additional opening in the back of the enclosure that gives more airflow back towards the window bay. Components like this inverter charger usually have built-in thermal protection that scale back operating performance if they get too warm. To keep things running as designed, make sure to include adequate ventilation. I now moved the top half in place and fed the wires from the wall through. I made sure the two halves were properly aligned and then screwed them together. One of the cables coming through the wall is the shore power input, which I routed over to the inverter side. The other wires need to run up to the distribution panel. I reconnected the wires to the links, adding the fuses and tightening everything to the final torques as I went. I connected the communication cables to the battery monitor display and the inverter remote, and then mounted the inverter on its cleat. The RJ45 cable for the inverter remote connects here. Next. I connect the battery connections running from the links. Then the AC input and AC output. The AC input comes from the shore power port on the outside wall of the bus, and the AC output goes to the distribution panel. The inverter enclosure ground bolts on here, with the star washer behind the lug and the flat washer, lock washer, and nut on top of the lug. Lastly, don't forget about these screws, and better yet, add them before connecting the wires, unlike I did here. And that's it for the inverter charger connections. With all the connections done, the cover can go back on. Another thing to not overlook is that every charger needs to be programmed to match the batteries it's charging. The solar charger and DC-DC chargers are pretty easy to program yourself. The MultiPlus inverter is not as straightforward to program, and I recommend purchasing it from a supplier that'll program it for you. To program it yourself, you need to connect it to a computer using the Victron MK3 USB interface. 
For this system, I ordered the batteries and the Victron components through Battleborn, and they programmed the MultiPlus before shipping it. Next, I reconnected the positive wire for the DC fuse block to the breaker, followed by the negative wire to the extra post on the Lynx distributor. Now on to the solar charge controller, starting with the cutoff breaker for the panels. This DIN rail breaker enclosure will hold the solar cutoff breaker. This was my first time trying this particular breaker enclosure, and it was decent overall, but I'm not a fan of these dinky rubber inlets that it had for the cable entry points. I cut slits in them in order to pass the wires through. It was hard to get the rubber inlets to stay in place, but at least, at a minimum, they will protect the wires from chafing on the plastic edges of the box opening. With the breaker outside the enclosure for more working room, but the wires coming in the openings in the enclosure, I connected the wires going to the charge controller to the bottom and the wires going to the panel to the top. The wires from the bottom of the panel connect to the PV plus minus terminals on the charge controller. Then I put the cover on the breaker enclosure. Lastly, you need to program the battery profile on the solar charge controller. There are a couple ways to go about this. The first is through a rotary switch located underneath the unit. Set the dial to the 7 position for lithium iron phosphate batteries. The second way is through the Victron Connect app. Open the app and connect to the charge controller. Go to the settings page and then the battery menu. Lastly, change the battery preset to correspond to your batteries. Let me note though that you need the main battery switch to be on in order for the charge controller to be powered on and allow you to connect through the app. You can do this at this point in the process or wait till the end once everything is connected. The alternator charge controllers are mixed up. The ground and output wires were previously connected and now I just need the input connection which is the wire I ran underneath the bus. I have one wire that needs to go to two separate charge controllers, so I'm adding this junction post to branch off the wire. Now I can take the wire coming up through the floor, add a lug to it, and route it toward the junction post. Then I made two more short wire segments with a lug on one end and a ferrule on the other. The first goes from the junction post to the lower DC-DC charger and the second goes from the junction post to the upper DC-DC charger. On each charger, make sure this green terminal block is plugged in with the wire bridge in place. Without this, the charger won't activate. As an additional function, you can use these two terminals to add a switch for remotely enabling or disabling the charger. When you are ready to program the charge controller, fire up the Victron Connect app and connect to the charger. Then go to the settings page. First make sure the function is set to charger and not power supply. Then make sure the battery settings are set to lithium iron phosphate. Lastly, go down to the engine shutdown detection page. Make sure engine shutdown detection is enabled. Here you need to set the alternator type to smart or conventional based on the vehicle. The engine shutdown detection feature allows the charger to automatically turn on and off when the engine is turned on and off, and it does this based on voltage. In my experience, the engine shutdown detection on the Orion works really well, but as an alternative, you can connect a hardwired ignition signal to the charger. The last thing I wired in down below was the wiring harness that comes down from the Dometic 12 volt air conditioner. That was the last thing getting connected to the Lynx distributor, so now I put the cover back on. You may have noticed that I have the Lynx mounted upside down. A sticker is provided with the Lynx to flip the text so that it can be mounted in this orientation if it works better in your arrangement. For one last thing down here, I'll snap the cover over the main fuse as well. The last thing to do is to wire up the distribution panel. I started by extending a couple of wires that were too short and then sorting the AC and DC cables into two separate bundles. Here you can see the DC cables on the right and the AC cables on the left. And again, these two wires are what come from the links to feed power to the DC fuse block, and this one is the AC output wire from the inverter. I worked on the AC side of the distribution panel first, 
I was batching each step and it went as follows. First, I cut all my cables to the same length and then stripped off about 8 inches of the sheathing. Then, I fed each wire through one of the internal cable clamps on the back of the panel. Once the cables were inside the panel, I stripped off the end of each wire so that I could crimp on a ferrule. Once all the ferrules were on, I wired all the green ground wires into the ground bar, then all the white neutral wires into the neutral bar. For the black or hot wires, I wired the output from the inverter to the main 30 amp breaker, and then I wired the hot from each branch circuit into one slot each on the rest of the breakers. Using tandem breakers allows you to fit up to six branch circuits alongside the main breaker. After this, I worked on the DC side, following a similar process. First, I cut all my cables to the same length and then stripped the cable sheathing back. Then, I stripped the end of each wire and crimped on a ferrule. The last step was to bring each wire into the box and wire the positive to a terminal on the fuse block and the negative into the negative terminal block. Here's what the inside of the panel should look like once everything's all wired in. The only thing missing is the fuses and the cover. Add those and it's here. With the distribution panel wired up, the system is complete. The last thing I did was more wire management with mounting zip ties to tidy and secure down the wires. Here's how everything looks. If you are looking to further understand all the connections, check out the schematic I have available on my website. Once everything is connected, you can turn things on and test that everything is working. First, turn on the main battery disconnect switch and then go through and make sure each component is functioning as it should. This is also a good time to set or double check that each component is programmed with the proper settings. I haven't covered the programming of the battery monitor yet, so let's go over that real quick. Open the app and connect to the monitor, and then head to the settings page. Here are all the settings for these Battleborn batteries. Capacity, 600 amp hours. Charge voltage, 14.4 volts. Discharge floor between 0 and 10%. Pukert exponent, 1.05 for lithium. Charge efficiency, 99%. Battery starts synchronized, turned off. This battery monitor will automatically synchronize the state of charge after the batteries have been fully charged. And that wraps it up. You can find links to parts and tools and to the schematic for this system in the description below. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching and happy building. Bye.